name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Happy Easter to all of you on this, uh, this most sublime feast of the entire church year. At Christmas, during Advent, during uh, Lent, we see the humanity of Christ. But on the resurrection, he shows us his divinity. He shows his body a, a very healthy, strong, 33-year-old. Our Lord was very strong and very well built. He was perfectly built like an instrument to fulfill its purpose. The instrument of music, the strings are tight and it's perfectly structured to take the beatings to produce the good sound. So our Lord, by the working of the Holy Ghost, formed in the virginal womb of the Virgin Mary, his body was perfect. The skeletal, the, the nerves, the muscles, the, the acuteness of his senses, and he was built to suffer. He was built to die. That's why he was built. And he was the lamb formed in the mother's womb to be the victim. That's why the Virgin Mary is so close to the work of the redemption. Because she prepared the body. It was her blood that pumped through the blood of Christ's veins. So our Lord, what did it take to take a 33-year-old man, very strong, perfectly built, very well conditioned, because he walked over 9,000 miles in his two years of public life. But what does it take to take a healthy man in the morning and have him dead by 3 p.m.? It took a lot. And dead and buried. And the Jews and the chief priests, the apostate priests, who lost the faith, who stood at the foot of the cross mocking him as God. If you're God, come down from the cross. Then we'll believe you. They, hit, they hurled insult after ridicule, after insult, after blasphemy. And what a lesson to us who get so easily impatient over little things. And Christ patiently suffered. Forgiving. Giving, giving us even his own mother. He gave himself totally, but he also gave us his mother, plus our guardian angel, plus the sacraments, plus the reenactment of the Mass in every Mass, his sacrifice, plus the divine life in the grace, by sanctifying grace, plus the home waiting for us, heaven, plus all the graces that he'll give us if we pray. He couldn't, like St. Augustine says, Lord, you couldn't give us more. How come we're so stingy with you and don't give you back all our love, all our mind, all our heart, all, all our will? We're so selfish. But our Lord, uh, notice his patience on the cross. He will rise. But had he come down from the cross at that moment, well, they wouldn't have believed him. But it was far more tremendous that the lamb that was slaughtered rise, the, 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 the lion of the tribe of Judah, rise glorious out of the tomb. For the tremendous earthquake, <clears throat> so tremendous was the earthquake, and the light that shined, as Saint Jerome says, the, the dawn that the dawn of the new day that rose out of the tomb outshined the sun. And that new day was the great resurrection of Christ. And the light that issued out of the tomb and rolled the rock over and broke all the seals of the Roman seals on the, on the rock. And the soldiers who were hired, the Jews, who were afraid that the apostles would come and seduce everybody saying, see, he rose from the dead like he said he would. 
So the Jews, uh, in their wickedness and knowing the prophecies, tried to stop it. So what they end up doing? They end up giving money to pay for the very first witnesses of the resurrection. Because the Roman soldiers, you know, they'll be shot or stabbed or cut in half if they sleep on their duty. So the Romans were very uh, diligent about fulfilling their duty. And they're being paid to watch an empty, uh, watch a grave, a dead man. And they're probably wondering them to themselves, these Jews, wasn't it enough for them to just to kill him and crucify him and bury him? Now they want a guards on his tomb? These people are crazy. But they became the first witnesses of the resurrection. And as the three women were coming with the spices and aloes to anoint the body on Easter Monday, Sunday, as the Sabbath was over, they witnessed the earthquake, and they saw the guards fall back. And they were as if dead, says the, says the witnesses, as if dead, velut mortui. And these were grown men, these were tough, crack troop soldiers of the whole world. These were, the, these were the Navy SEALs of the Roman Empire. And they're shaking in their boots. They are flat on the ground, as if dead, scared. Just imagine being on duty to watch over a cemetery, and one of the graves comes alive <laughs> in the middle of the night. So you get a little idea that they were struck with fear. But it was a tremendous earthquake too, and the and the light and the power of, of our Lord rising. And <clears throat> then the uh, the Jews ran. Excuse me. The Romans ran to the Jews and said, "Look, pay us, pay us the money. We don't know. We can't explain it. But he's risen from the dead. The tomb is empty. And there was a light and there was an earthquake. This man had to be God." And so the Jews, says the scripture, the Jews forked out more money to tell them and convince them, look, we'll give you more money if you, if you don't say anything about this. And maybe one of those Roman soldiers, perhaps, maybe, maybe, we don't know for sure, but maybe it was Longinus. Maybe he refused the money. Longinus later converted to become a Catholic, and he would die a martyr for the Catholic faith. Uh, many of these um, modern so-and-sos, atheists who attack the resurrection, they often say, we'll use the argument, well, the apostles had a collective hallucination. And in their collective hallucination, they dreamt up the resurrection. But the facts defy that. The facts of the gospel show, firstly, these were fishermen, most of them, and they were down-to-earth, very human apostles. And we also discover in the scriptures they were anything but quick to believe in the resurrection. Peter listening to the women, uh, women's, these women are dreaming. When Mary Magdalene came and the three women told them the tomb is empty. And the, the apostles and disciples were so uninterested because they were so depressed, because they really lost the faith. They really thought he was the Messiah, but he's dead now. There's no more hope. So they were so uh, uninterested that two of the disciples were already walking home. Cleophas and his friend. They were walking home to Emmaus, seven miles out of Jerusalem. And then St. Thomas. St. Thomas is a, is a friend of modern rationalists. But St. Thomas wouldn't believe, even after the apostles had seen our Lord on Easter Sunday, touched his wounds, saw him eat, and wept over his wounds for betraying him. And so St. Thomas is, is our friend in a way because his disbelief cures our disbelief. And the apostles were, were down to earth. They were anything but prone to hallucination. And you know, St. Peter's real, realism and putting his foot in his mouth so frequently with our 
in the Gospels. And then, if this was all a collective hallucination, and just a lie, what kind of fools would these twelve apostles be to go out and preach the resurrection, which on a Pentecost Sunday converted thousands of Jews? And the thousands of Jews, this was 50 days after the crucifixion. Golgotha was still there. The cross was still up there. The tomb that was empty was still there. They could go and see. They could just go and see. The evidence was there. And we're talking thousands of Jews. Plus our Lord appeared five times on Easter Sunday, five times after Easter Sunday throughout the 40 days visiting the apostles and instructing them how to say Mass and so forth. Plus, St. Paul says, Christ appeared to 500 disciples at once. Some of them died, but most of them are still alive. And if the apostles were really hallucinating and liars, what kind of, really, what kind of idiot, what kind of idiot preaching a lie would risk their life? And we saw, we, you can see how they were imprisoned, they were scourged, they were, their life was suffering and miserable. And it wouldn't stop there, they will die for the fact of the resurrection. They will all die brutal deaths, the apostles. Would they do this for a lie? Absolutely not. It was the truth. They witnessed it, they saw our Lord. The, the resurrection is real. And for us, modern man, we have one of the most powerful gifts from heaven, the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud, every time scientists try to disprove it, they just find more and more evidence to show it's the real thing. And it's not just the Shroud of Death, it's the Shroud of His Resurrection. Because the image is burnt right into the the image of Christ's face and all his wounds and everything is burnt into the cloth. It's in, burnt through the cloth. And it's not like Veronica's veil um, as a cloth would be, it would show a wider image because being going flat on the face and on the body, it would be a wider image. Just take a, take a, take a paper towel and cover your face and see that it's wide. But in the Shroud of Turin, it's a 3D image. The, in, the whole body of Christ passed through the cloth. And that's why when NASA put it through their high-tech written lasers and CAT scans and whatever, they all got the chills. They all got freaked out, really. Why? Because they saw that this cloth it's as if a man was lying under it right then and there. There's a 3D image, which means Christ's body passed through it. And the brilliant light that is resurrection burnt also the image of the two coins that were in his eyes. When he would, when the Jews, when they buried someone, they would close the eyelids with coins. And the coins burnt their image right into the cloth and uh, they pick up the images of the coins that were only pounded in the time of Pontius Pilate. They have the symbol of Pontius Pilate and even the date. Plus the <coughs> pollen. The pollen on the cloth is from the Middle East. And that, that area of Jerusalem where only certain flowers grow and only flowers that bud and release pollen only in the month of April and May. And that all, the, all that pollen is intact on the shroud. So, <clears throat> what a gift. What a gift for us. Plus, St. Paul himself, St. Paul was a fanatical, well, that a better word would be deeply devoted to the Jewish religion. So devoted to the Jewish religion, he was persecuting the Catholic people. So how do you take scripture and so fire, such a fireball and such a down-to-earth man, St. Paul, who was a very practical man, 
and a leader changing like that. And what converted him? He saw our Lord. He never saw him in his earthly life, but he saw him resurrected. And Christ knocked him off his horse and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And St. Paul said, uh, persecuting you, I have never met you. But our Lord meant you know, his mystical body. So St. Paul met our Lord. And then our Lord, of course, as we Catholics know so well, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of times has Christ appeared to saints, to blesseds, to venerables, Eucharistic miracles, and uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque of the Sacred Heart. And uh, Jesus appearing as a baby on the altar to many saints, like St. Thomas de Corinth. Our Lord appeared as a little two-year-old boy patting him on the head at the altar. And then uh, how often our Lord appeared to many, many, many saints. You just can't even hardly count them all. So our Lord is, is risen. His body is in heaven. It's resurrected. It's glorified. And the Virgin Mary is also there. And St. Francis of the Sale and the church has always held a little tradition that St. Joseph was also assumed in heaven. So, we also will rise from the dead. We're all going to die, but think about this, because it's true. 500,000 years from now, we're all going to be alive. You're not just going to die and turn into food for worms. Your soul goes on. And after the resurrection of the dead, at the end of the world, you will have your new body. And you will be about 30 years old. You will be strong. All, all the body will be perfect. And share in the glorified body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the first to rise from the dead. As Adam was the first to bring the human race into death and suffering, so Christ is the first to repair it and to rise from the dead. So let us ask, the Mother of God in this Holy Mass, our dear Blessed Mother, how she must have suffered. Because our Lord died on Good Friday and His suffering was over. But the Mother of God continued to hear the pounding of the nails, continued to hear the blasphemies and mockeries, continued to hear the, the terrorizing scourging that just tortured her mind all those hours, Friday night, she never slept. Saturday, all day, the Blessed Mother, that's her day, the Holy Saturday. She was so crushed. And the scripture speaks about her sorrows. Oh, you who pass by the way, see if there is any sorrow like unto my sorrow. Deep as the sea is my sorrow, and no one can console me. And the Virgin Mary uh, so crushed. That's why in many good Catholic countries, especially Spain, on Holy Saturday they carry in procession in the streets the image of the great Virgin Mary dressed in black, decked with gems and jewels and tears in her eyes, holding the, the crown of thorns, because it's her day of sorrows. And so certainly we all know from the mystics, from common sense, from tradition, that when our Lord rose from the dead, the first one he went to, and according to one of the mystics, our Lord shortened the three days. He didn't go a full three days in the tomb. Why? Out of pity for his own mother. She was so heart wrenched. She was, she was a lily that was beaten to the ground. But our Lord will rise early Sunday morning, and after knocking down the soldiers, the first one he came to visit was his mother, to lift up that dove morning, to lift up that lily so pure and crushed, and bring it back to its, its former beauty. There's certainly, well, what would he have said to his mother? Well, we can only guess, but certainly she would have kissed his hands and adored his wounds. 
that she just saw three days before uh, bleeding and held in her arms. So that same glorified Christ, that same Jesus Christ the King, and we say that in the glory of you, two solus sanctus, you are the only one that's holy. You are the only one that's uh, the most high, Jesus Christ. Two solus sanctus, two solus dominus, you are the only Lord and God, there is no other. And that glorified Christ so loves each soul that in every Mass, this is the tremendous beauty of the Mass, as he reenacts his sacrifice and gives you his glorified flesh, his glorified body, his glorified sacred heart, his precious blood to drink. And so you are consumed with the divine fire of Christ's heart himself. So that is what we want to really ask in this day of the resurrection, which lasts all week long. It's, the whole week is one big resurrection day. It's all a first class feast. And if Mother Church fed you so well that during Advent, excuse me, during Lent, with a Mass for every day, at Easter every day there's a Mass. And I, I would encourage you to follow and read the Mass of each day. They're, they're, every one of them is powerful. So Easter. We, uh, we have 40 days of fasting, but now we got 50 days of feasting. Feasting in the love of God, in the, the purity of heart, and uh, to really grow in the love of the, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so our Lord, He wants that of us, to grow strong in the faith, and to grow in the love of God. And to love God and to love our Lord Jesus Christ means you have to fight for Him. You gotta fight for him, like a soldier. That's why you're all confirmed. You're not confirmed into the church holiday in. You're confirmed into the church militant. Which means you have to fight for the faith. And when we are in this new crisis of the Catholic faith, where tradition is being completely ransacked, hijacked, and vitiated of all its militancy, by this seeking agreement with modernist Rome, these records of the faith, it's so, such a contradiction to seek to make an agreement with those destroying the faith, with the, with the hallucination, that's a true hallucination, of pretending to want to build the church and work with those who are at the same time destroying the church. It's a total contradiction. So we must fight for the faith. And that means no compromise with Vatican II and the New Mass. And everybody's saying, well, there is no compromise, there's no agreement. What's everybody worried about? Yeah, there has been an agreement with Rome. When that declaration was signed by Bishop Follet, he caved in. And that agreement, that's the step to the agreement. Just like, pardon the example, especially on Easter Sunday, but um, if a murderer, uh, uh, if a murderer intends, I'm going to go next week and murder that person, when does he sin? When he murders him the week after or when he intends to do it? With full consent and deliberation, and to use the words of the general chapter statement, uh, to approve and determine to commit that murder, when is the sin mortal? When does he fall into mortal sin? It's when he fully consents. And the actual murder a week later is just another mortal sin, but it's, it's, it's a consequence of what he consented to the week before. So it is with this, uh, this document of the 15th of April 2012, the superiors signed this document, which is a betrayal of the faith, a compromise of the faith, accepting the new mass as legitimate, which it's not, accepting Vatican II in the Latin tradition, accepting religious liberty and non-Christian religious document of Vatican II as reconcilable with tradition, it's not. They're heresies condemned by the church. So, and, and the general chapter statement says, we determine and approve to make this agreement with unconverted Rome. That's the crime already, already, and it's never been rejected. And that's why we cannot go with that. We have to fight and keep the faith of tradition and the true Mass. But the Mass builds on the faith. 
builds on the faith. A hundred years ago, the modernists condemned and excommunicated under St. Pius X. Were they saying the new Mass? No. Were they having altar girls on the altar? No. Did they give communion in the hand? Never. Were they wearing their cassocks? Most of the time, probably. So what was wrong? Latin Mass, incense, cassock, no abuses, no liturgical dances. So what was wrong? The wrong thing was they didn't have the right Catholic faith. That's why they were excommunicated and condemned. So it's not enough, as many traditional Catholics <laughs> think, oh, well, we got the Mass, we got tradition. That's not what tradition's about. The Catholic faith is, is very, it converts everything. <coughs> and one of the touchstones of liberalism is they hate the idea of Christ the King. The liberals love the idea of separation of church and state. But that's a condemned heresy, and no Roman Catholic is allowed to think that way. As a Roman Catholic, we are obliged to believe in the kingship of Christ, that he must reign, and the state must recognize the true religion. And Vatican II completely blasts away the kingship of Christ. That's why we oppose Vatican II. It attacks our king and our God, and we will fight it to the death, and never compromise with Vatican II and the new mass. But Vatican II is alive and kicking. Just look at Pope Francis. It's alive and kicking. Look what it's doing to Bishop Follet. It's vitiated everything out of him. He's now become a ballerina dancer of the faith to his shame. And pray for him. And it's affecting many priests. Just read Bishop, Fale Bishop uh, Williamson's letter of yesterday. It's a great letter. And he, he reveals the letter of Father Stalin the district superior of of Poland, who's now going to the Eastern Bloc, going now to this be district superior of Asia. His letter is completely liberal. He really believes we need to make the agreement, lest we become schismatic and city vacantes. Was the Archbishop worried about that? No. He said, "We have the faith. We're not outside the church. We're not city vacantes. We acknowledge the Pope, but we have to resist him because he's going against all his predecessors." and betraying Christ. Did Peter stop being Pope when he betrayed Christ? No. He was always Pope. But he was a bad Pope at that time, but he repented. And he certainly ran to the Virgin Mary after, after the Passion was over. He, all the apostles flocked to her, to the Mother. And she took them all in her, her huge heart, and they wept at her feet. They betrayed her son, and she was mother to them, and she still, still is mother, and she wants the Pope to consecrate Russia. She didn't ask for the Orthodox Metropolitan of Russia, or the Metropolitan of Constantinople, or the Metropolitan of Kiev, of these, of these uh, schismatic, true schismatic, and uh, orthodox false churches, although they do have the valid mass, and it's a beautiful mass, but you can't go to it because they don't have the right faith. And she asked that the Pope of Rome consecrate Russia. And this crisis will go on until the Pope does that. So battle on, and let us go to this, the heart of Jesus, the lion massacred on the altar. The little lamb that opened not his mouth in the crucifixion, now the lamb, the lion roars, roars with the glory of his glorified body and his victorious wounds. And he, you, you will receive his glorified body very soon. So let us ask the Mother of God to, to burn in us the great love of God, love for the faith, so that we are willing even to die in defense of this beautiful, victorious Catholic faith of all time. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, conceive without sin. Pray for us who have recourse to Thee. O Mary, us who have recourse to Thee.